Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silence so they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Can we have agreement to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private and to consider a draft report on post-legislative scrutiny of the biodiversity and biodiversity reporting duties in private at future meetings? Thank you. Item number two is our post-legislative scrutiny item. It's biodiversity and biodiversity reporting duties. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Hugh Dignan, Head of Wildlife Management and Protected Areas of the Scottish Government, and Sally Thomas, Director of Policy and Advice, Scottish Natural Heritage. I understand the Cabinet Secretary won't be making an opening statement, so we will move straight to questions. Cabinet Secretary, can I kick off by asking you um, if you feel the reporting duty on biodiversity is working? Um, I, I think there is room for immense progress. We're only in the second round uh, of the actual uh, reporting duty being live. The first was in 2015, of course. Um, uh, and it's fair to say that I think it's taking a while <laughs> for public bodies to really uh, um, uh, become alive to this. Uh, so uh, I would say it is, it, it is working, but nowhere near, I suspect, what the movers of the original amendment to the bill wanted to see. Um, so that really is a work in progress, yeah. Okay. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Cabinet Secretary, um, just following on what you touched on there in the in the first reporting cycle there was a 44% compliance rate in terms of uh, in terms of uh, reporting what is the, the second reporting cycle finished in january what was the figure for that has there been an improvement well um it's it's still basically uh, um, uh, being compiled um at this point we're at 41% so um, the expectation is that by the end of the year, we will be higher than we were in 2015, but there are still a lot of public bodies, it's fair to say, who are not actually engaged in the reporting process. Um, I did go and uh, pull down a long list of the public bodies that are covered by this. Um, and I suspect what's happening is those public bodies that are quite far away in their actions, in their functions, quite far away from uh, uh, from this um, are probably f finding it difficult to, uh, to, to engage. So if you're the accountant in bankruptcy, it might be more understandable why y you, you might have a, have, a, have a challenge there. Now, I use that because I have no idea whether the accountant ba in bankruptcy has actually reported, but I think the point I'm making is that there are, of that enormous list of public bodies, there are some who are quite a long way away from uh, uh, in terms of their functions, in terms of their job, quite a long way away from, uh, from this. And, and it is clearly uh, a task um, to try and engage them all in understanding that no matter how far away they are, there still is a duty um, on them. Um, but, you know, as you would understand, if you're SNH, you're, you're not going to have a difficulty Make, making that report. If you are one of these other bodies, you you may you may not really have registered uh, at this stage. Although it's fair to say that we do um, write out to every single one of the public bodies when we're coming up to the reporting date to remind them. So, you know, we are trying to engender that understanding, but uh, it is still uh, it is still the case that there are a number of them who are just not really getting it or perhaps don't quite understand what it is they're being asked to do. I, th I think that uh, just again building on that, when we took evidence previously on this, uh, there seemed to be a consensus that more guidance was needed uh, to provide more clarity as to the duties that were required and even simply the, re the reporting format even. Is there any thoughts that uh, there might be some improvement on that? Well, there is quite a lot of guidance, and uh, I suppose one of the questions that um, I might have of, of public bodies is whether or not they are actually availing themselves of what is already available 
in terms of information because there are template forms, uh, three different sorts of forms that are tailored to you know, the size of, a, of an organization or perhaps the nature of it. So that there, are, there, is, there is already some uh, nuancing uh, uh, that, is, that is available to them. And there, are, uh, uh, th there is quite a lot of guidance already available. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure what else at the moment could be provided for them uh, in terms of extra to what is already there. I, I think the problem may be that they're not actually going and, and, and finding it in the first place, rather than they're not being sufficient when they get there. Cabinet Secretary, do you feel that that's perhaps because uh, a lot of these public bodies are stretched, um, you know, are feeling financial pressure, are under a lot of pressure to deliver their core services? Is the biodiversity reporting duty just a step too far if it's out with, as you said in your one of your responses, if it's out with their core function? Well, uh, I mean, it, it has been legislated for in terms of functions. So... Uh, in the sense, I'd, when I was talking about being out with the core functions, I was talking about those public bodies who's, who, by, their, by, by definition, are not doing things uh, uh, that relate to nature or biodiversity or anything, and therefore it's perhaps not in the forefront of their minds, and therefore it, it might be quite hard for them to envisage how they, how they achieve this. The original uh, legislative provision dates back to 2004, and that was to... to, to to have, the, have, the, have the, the duty to have regard to biodiversity was there. Um, the reporting, and, and, and I've no idea how, I'm guessing by the nature of what happened with the bill in 2010 is that there was a feeling that that didn't really achieve anything. So perhaps by reporting on it might, might help achieve more. So perhaps it has done some of that. Um, but in terms of the reporting, our view is that actually the reporting function is not a huge resource issue. Um, it, it might be the case that actually different public, public bodies might be prepared to expend more of their time and resource on doing the actual function. But the reporting part of it, we, I, it's, we find it difficult to see that the reporting part of it is a resource intensive issue per se. I, I'm not sure that that's actually what the problem is in terms of the reporting, okay. to be honest. That's useful, thank you. Bill Bowman. Well, thank you. Talking about the, the resource and data then, oh, good morning, sorry. <laughs> um, the, one of the um, evidence givers last week spoke about um, the information that was available to them in a sort of condensed urban area, but they were part of a larger region. And it was difficult to, if you like, put their report in context because there wasn't um, any form of hub there that collected information for the whole area. And so we were wondering if the, the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum could get more support um, from the government to try and encourage um, information being held, being searchable in a form um, that would give individual preparers more, more localised data. Um, well, I think with the SBIF is currently in uh, the middle of uh, undertaking a piece of work uh, which uh, may or may not um, include recommendations that relate to that. So I suppose, you know, my, my answer to that is that perhaps that's something we should wait and see what, what they have to say. Um, uh, it, it was formed at the same time as this... Um, particular clause was passed through uh, in uh, the bill and uh, they're currently doing a costed business case so my my expectation is that the, we will see some more concrete uh, um, suggestions and proposals uh, around the area of the question um, they are as I understand it indeed looking for support to build uh, um, a better recording infrastructure and I think the difficulty with all of this is that it what we're actually talking about is the reporting recording bit of it not the actual doing part of it um, and I, I suppose while you know my my feeling is that I I would also want 
there to be some focus on the doing part, not not just the reporting part. Um, uh, you know, and I'm 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 just a little bit wary about putting an enormous amount of time and effort into a reporting infrastructure, which runs a risk perhaps of becoming slightly top heavy and becoming more of a resource issue, um, and 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 then detract from the actual the actual activity of having regard to biodiversity. The regional reporting idea um, uh, was was interesting when I when I read that, but. But actually, um, we, we think that would become very difficult to manage because apart from anything else, there are national bodies that you would then have to somehow disaggregate into regional figures to try and make a regional. If you create a regional hub, how does that get hosted? How does that get run? You're, you're then ramping up the infrastructure of reporting. And I'm not sure if they're not reporting now, they're necessarily going to report any more frequently to a regional hub. So I'm not... I'm not certain that the regional hub idea, from my perspective, would really would really solve the issue here. I think it was also partly to give them information for when they're deciding how they deal with biodiversity, not just report it. Ah, but that's interesting then, because that's n not what this clause is about. This clause is about the reporting, the function uh, of doing, and that's why I made the distinction between the two things in my earlier answer, that I, th I think there's perhaps m more of an issue about uh, um, them fulfilling a, a, a kind of that, that function of having regard to biodiversity. And for some, it will be tougher to see how they do that than it is for others. There's no doubt about it. If you're not really one of the landholding agencies, there aren't perhaps m the obvious opportunities that there might be. Um, uh, and, but that, that doing part, this sounds a bit nursery, but it's, it's to kind of distinguish between the, the activity that was legislated for in 2004 and then the reporting part, which was legislated for in 2010. So if the reporting that part is... Secretary. Sorry? I think you're very clear on yeah. that. I think that's useful. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it, in a sense, they're meant to be, but the reporting is about the doing. And if you're actually not engaged in the doing, they may feel that there is nothing to report if they're even aware that they should be reporting. Okay. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Mr. Council, that leads me nicely into what I was going to ask anyway, to scratch below the surface of the reporting and see who's doing what. And we had some good examples actually last week, uh, particularly from well, the East Ayrshire submission, the paper that was submitted. They uh, embed their, their duties in a number of the, you know, the, the engagements that they, they carry out in, in East Ayrshire. For example, they, they have a species survey which they, they, they create when they're thinking about maintenance of capital, you know, maintenance of buildings and capital programmes, for example. They, they have a local records centre. Uh, they have enhanced species protection when they're thinking about planning and building standards. So despite the fact that we were hearing about the lack of reporting, when we looked a little below that to see who was doing what, there was quite a lot of good work going on there. And it was really to ask, have you any similar evidence from the other public bodies who do have a land interest, whether they're actually doing the doing, as you, um, as you say. Yeah, I mean, there will be a lot of public bodies in, in that same position, and, and uh, uh, I would hazard a guess and say most local authorities are, are, uh, are having regard to that function. Now, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot you can do. It can be easier if you're a landholder, so you will find, you know, for example, uh, health boards are beginning to look much more closely at what what they're what's happening on their estates. Uh, there are you know there are a number of other public bodies who work very hard at this. Scottish Water would probably have an incredibly good story to tell uh, about about everything that they're doing. Um, so yes, there are some incredibly good examples. Um, uh, you know, so it, it the, the 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 lack of reporting doesn't mean that there is a lack of action and and good work being done. Uh, the, the question is being able to gather it in um, and then uh, and then show it in one place um, across the whole of Scotland. And that's the bit that we're finding difficult. Yeah. We also asked convener about how these processes embrace and engage with the public, the wider public. They, they tend to kind of happen anyway in some of the East Ayrshire, but there's no formal requirement to engage the public in a, in a new plan, for example, for, with a, from a diet biodiversity perspective, as I understand it. But it does happen. Uh, but we were kind of testing the water with that last week, and it seemed to be kind of piecemeal. 
in terms of whether uh, the public bodies go out proactively to engage with the public when they're considering any new piece of work, for example, within their, their, their area. So just to get your thoughts on how we could perhaps strengthen that kind of engagement process with the public in this. Well, I mean, I, th I think um, uh, public engagement is really important. And in some cases, it's about simply being clear and explaining why they're doing what they're doing, or in some cases with local authorities now, explaining why they're not doing something that has been done. You know, there's a big debate about road verges and roundabouts and, and things like that, and local authorities um, are taking decisions about, uh, about what the planting looks like and whether they're going to uh, mow or not mow or when they're going to do it and all the rest of it. And, and it can mystify, I think, members of the public as to why why something is not happening that used to be happening, but there might be a very good reason for it. So that is about communication. Now, each each public body will have its own way, and and you know some public bodies will be a lot better than others at, at that direct kind of communication. Um, engagement, I, I think, when it comes to local authorities, my experience would be that there's quite a lot of engagement with people because a lot of the activity that goes on in this particular area of delivering that function involves vast numbers of volunteers. And, you know, I think we're still in volunteers week. So I would want to kind of say that, that, you know, even for public bodies, a huge amount of the activity they undertake will involve volunteers. I'd be amazed if, you know, that council wasn't harnessing the, 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 that army of volunteers to do that. And that is um, a very strong level of engagement. Um, but again, we're talking about the actual function of the duty rather than the reporting part. So the, the question is, how do we actually get all of those public bodies who are, you know, doing this to make sure they are reporting it? I'd be surprised if they're not. And those who are perhaps not really having this at the forefront of minds to understand that they should be thinking about it in their in the, in the course of their business. And that was what was asked of them. They weren't asked to be turned into, the, well, we weren't asking to turn them all into mini SNHs. We were asking them to have regard in the course of their normal functions to biodiversity. And then some years later, we asked them to report on what that meant, what that looked like. So uh, I suspect out there, there may be a bit of a confusion as to what exactly they're supposed to be doing. And in some cases, I suspect they don't really have much of a notion. But okay, thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, on just exactly that line of question, if I may, first of all, on the reporting, uh, is there, I'm not aware of there being any sanction if the report doesn't come in. Is, is that correct? There are no sanctions um, uh, if the report doesn't come in. I did indicate that what we do is um, write out to all the public bodies in the run-up to a, a, a reporting deadline. Um, so somewhere on somebody's desk in every single one of these public bodies, there will be a letter <laughs> saying, by the way, you need to think about this. Um, but no, there aren't sanctions. That wasn't part of the original um, debate in 2010. Um, and uh, to be honest, from, from our, where we stand, there isn't always a, a relationship between sanctions um, and more effective reporting. And when you're talking about public bodies, it's difficult quite how you would build a sanction regime into it when you're, when you're talking about public bodies. How would, how would you know, we sanction? It, it would be, it would be, um, it, it would be, that would be a curious conversation to have to have. Um, and, you know, for example, there are no sanctions for failure to report on climate change duties, but we get 100% reporting on climate change duties. So I think this is more about people's understanding of perhaps the importance of, or the relevance of, or whatever, rather than a, 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 a kind of deliberate set your face against it idea. So I'm not sure sanctions in this, in this would necessarily help. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to be honest about that. So I think it's more about actually getting them to understand what that 2004 duty was, and and how they how they have to how they have to um, uh, um, how they have to report on it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps an exercise that we could undertake now, given that we did write out to everybody <laughs> uh, in the run up to the deadline, is you know 
write out to them again and 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 flag up that we're now halfway through the year and there is now parliamentary interest in the in the in the lack of reporting might generate a little bit more engagement mm -hmm. no that, that, that makes perfect sense to me uh, it was just uh, I, I was wondering if you if you ended up in a situation where let's say a public body didn't have the resource for example uh, or it, perhaps it didn't have the sufficient knowledge but I suppose you would say well we're writing out to them so they're going to comply uh, got a you know in every single public body there is a letter sitting on somebody's desk mm -hmm. <laughs> now you know one could ask quite why that doesn't trigger at least some response, I, I, I don't know. Um, the reporting duty, uh, as far as I can see, would be a matter of, you know, going onto the website, downloading some of the template. I don't, I don't think the reporting part of this is the resource thing. I suspect what might be happening is that those public bodies that haven't really paid any attention to the original 2004 duty kind of don't report because they've got nothing to report. I, sus I suspect, and I'm looking at officials just to get, I suspect that's perhaps what's happening. And they see a letter and they kind of go, well, we don't really have anything to say. Well, would, would you or Sally like to come in on that? I mean, Sally heard some of the evidence right. last week. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to add to that? I think, um, I think as the Cabinet Secretary has said, there is a, a, a lot of really good uh, and detailed guidance there. Um, and it's about raising awareness, um, either through that guidance or maybe through a more tailored approach with some of the public bodies which find it difficult to report. Um, the, the guidance includes a number of case studies which were worked up in conjunction with public bodies after the 2015 round of reporting to, to try and illustrate two different public bodies of uh, of different sizes and with the different ranges of functions, actually what, what, what they could do to um, fulfil their duty, to show that it isn't um, just a duty that you need to have perhaps large areas of land at your disposal in order to be able to comply with the duty, that even doing very small um, activities within, within the, the body and the way that they exercise their functions can help to contribute to the, beauty, to, to the duty. So I think those case studies certainly would be very useful and certainly we could, you know, we could, we can recirculate those and add to the, you know, general levels of awareness. Liam Kerr. But is there uh, any value? Because it, it, what we heard last week was very clear to me that, that different bodies, as you've rightly pointed out, Cabinet Secretary, have different uh, levels of engagement and different requirements to engage. Uh, so should we actually be looking at making the duties to both comply and then to report proportionate to the, the size and indeed the core business of the public bodies in question? I think proportionality is very important and I think we all have to kind of understand that, um, uh, that particular uh, issue. Um, but as I indicated earlier, I think the guidance that's on the SNH website already does um, build into that uh, a level of proportionality. Um, I mean, clearly, if you're a landholding public body, um, then there is a greater expectation, both in terms of the function and uh, potentially in terms of the reporting, because you ought to have far more to report. The, the, there's, a, there's a different uh, uh, level of in, engagement. Um, and... Uh, and uh, you know, if, or if you're a public body where some of your main responsibilities do have a direct link to or involve biodiversity, you're in a different position um, to those public bodies that are a very, very long, long way away from that in terms of both their functions and their capacity perhaps to do anything. I mean, in some cases, um, you know, we would be talking perhaps about simply, you know, getting folk in to put in window boxes or something if all you've got is a building and and not much else then you know you may simply be looking at something like that um but i'm not quite sure whether or not folk are are are, are, are thinking along uh, along those lines um so the proportionality issue i think is really really important um but the reporting the guidance that's there already recognizes that there's kind of three levels of you know, three different templates so that they ought to be able to find something that does actually fit what their, uh, what their, what their public body's core function is and size of it and all the rest of it. Very small public bodies uh, um, as opposed to very large pub public bodies as well. But again, as I said, there's, there is already inbuilt uh, variation 
if they go and have a look at what is available. I'm just, where I'm a little, um, what, what I suspect is they're not actually getting as far as even going to look. It's not as if they're going to look and going, don't know what that all means, not going to do anything. I'm not sure they're actually finding it in the first place. Liam Kerr. Uh, final quick question for me. I, I do understand, uh, I'm going to stay with reporting, although I do appreciate that you were saying, look, that's actually the second stage. Uh, but just, we heard last week about uh, the publication date uh, being on the 1st of January to report on the previous three years. And a concern was raised that look, that timing isn't actually ideal. Uh, given that there'll be holidays and w what we end up ha uh, doing is producing a report that actually doesn't take you right up to the 1st of January. So uh, the, the, the question is simply, would you be supportive of a change to that timing of the reporting cycle in light of those facts? Well, I mean, I don't have personally incredibly strong views about that. My suspicion is that almost any reporting date will have some of those same issues. There's always going to be a bit of a time lag. There's always going to be uh, issues there. Um, I think the important thing from the point of view of this conversation is that if we change the reporting date, we would need to amend the primary legislation to do so. So that's actually quite a big hammer to crack what is perhaps not a very big nut. Um, and uh, I mean, we can certainly consider it. As I said, I, I don't have a, 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 a strong view about it if, if that seems to be something that really is an issue. Not clear... I don't think that it is um, uh, an issue. We, I mean, we do accept late reporting. It's not as if that deadline is in by then and 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 forever hold your peace. I mean, you know, as things come in, we will we will take them. So uh, uh, I don't I don't think that reporting deadline is as big an issue as possible and uh, as it might be. And uh, I'm just noting that the evaluation that was done of the 2015 reporting round didn't say anything about the reporting date at that point. So it didn't look like in that first round it was something that was particularly flagged up. The key thing from our perspective, though, is it would require amending primary legislation to do it. Thank you. Alex Neil. The Cabinet Secretary, at the evidence session last week, one of the key issues was the absence of information on outcomes. Um, and it strikes me that is there any evidence that all of this reporting activity is actually, actually adding any value to biodiversity? Um, I, I suppose uh, uh, that's a fair question. Um, I, I suspect at the moment all of those public bodies that are engaged in actively um, uh, furthering that biodiversity function would be doing so whether or not there was a reporting duty. Um, I, I think slightly ramping up the communication around the reporting duty um, and perhaps trying to be more proactive with those public bodies that are not reporting may engender an increased uh, um, uh, activity, even if it was quite small because some public bodies there wouldn't really be a huge opportunity um, uh, and and that would make a difference but but we would have to be making sure that we were pulling in not just those who weren't reporting but those who weren't actually carrying out any of the function either um, and it's 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 the kind of that you know would would be a huge undertaking I mean I did I did download a list of all the public bodies and we're at about 100 and 80 or something at the moment so we're you know we're an enormous range so it'll be a huge undertaking to to ensure that each and every single one of them uh, was actively doing something in terms of biodiversity and then actively reporting it mm. um, that's not that it can't be done I just think it's taking a while to get that out there I and if, you know cycle m m means we're only in the second reporting cycle I have to say, I, I, the mind boggles at what the accountant in bankruptcy could do to add any well, real value to biodiversity. I'm not saying that there isn't something that can be done. I mean, uh, I, I spoke at a completely different event yesterday about the biodiversity, and I, you know, I, I said that there is there is an argument, and and it's an argument for all of us to ensure that people understand that biodiversity isn't something sitting up here that they have no part in, and you could have a vision of, you know, every tenement 
in Edinburgh, every window in every tenement in Edinburgh having a window box would create a massive, big, you know, plus for biodiversity uh, in the city. And that could apply to um, offices, including the public bodies, as to everybody else. So there is always something people can do. It's just that it may feel to people like, A, they may not register that is something that's, that's, that's valuable in terms of because of the low, the, 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 the small scale of it. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just simply may not be registering in their minds as something that they could be doing. Um, you know, it, it, and, and often these things have multiple functions because, you know, the provision of, I mean, I don't want to sound trite, but the provision of window boxes, you know, is in terms of a workplace environment is, is a lot better in terms of people's working environment than it is than, than not to have that. So you, you, you don't just get a biodiversity plus, you get a working environment plus, you begin to get a, um, uh, you know, an, an engagement. But I, I, think it's a, I think it's still very much a work in progress. Okay. Yep. okay. Do members have any further questions for the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you a final question then? Sure. Um, really, do you think this, the uh, provision needs to change at all um, in the legislation, or do you feel that it's perhaps um, a wee bit of a challenge for your department in terms of awareness of public bodies um, to uh, to comply with the duty? Um, I think the challenge is around um, trying to increase the level of compliance um, uh, and behind the compliance with the reporting is the is the challenge in getting a, a, you know, a number of these public bodies to understand that however little can be done, it is still valuable and does contribute. And I think that's where the bit of the gap is. But then that's not just with public bodies. That's, I suspect, right across society, people understanding that even a small amount multiplied across a huge number makes a big difference. Okay. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now suspend the meeting briefly to allow a changeover of witnesses. Item three is section 22 reports on colleges. I'd like to welcome Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Helen Russell, Senior Audit Manager, Mark McPherson, Senior Manager from Audit Scotland, and Lucy Nutley, Director, Public Services Audit from Mazars. Have I pronounced that correctly? Yes. Mazars, okay. Um, I'd like to open questioning, please, from Alec Neil. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, Auditor General. Um, I think we're going to discuss both colleges together rather than make them as separate items. They convene a, can I say in both cases, I, I think s s there are aspects of these reports that um, pose more questions than they answer. Uh, let me give you an example in a new college, Lanarkshire. It says that uh, under auditor's opinion, that uh, the audit has highlighted concerns about the college's financial sustainability, full stop. Um, but we don't get the reasons behind that and what needs to be done to address it. 
Um, later on, for example, in paragraph 9, it says there were unexpected costs associated with Cote Bridge College. Well, what were they and when did they occur and why did they occur and why did nobody do anything about it, timidly, if that's the case? Um, in paragraph 11, it did not include any cost in its budget and the final additional cost was £400,000 in relation to national bargaining. Why not? Um, you know, was there no, you know, even provision made in it? In paragraph 12, very serious statement about, say, not paying people on time in order to improve their cash flow, which is totally contradictory to government policy uh, right across the board. Um, paragraph 13, financial reporting concerns, what were they? Uh, and that's that's from what's in the report. And certainly, you know, I've got other concerns, for example, about New College Lanarkshire um, that I know about in terms of staffing, the the relationship between the number of people at senior level, and I think the same is true, there's concern in Edinburgh College about the number of highly paid people at senior level while we're making people who are delivering lectures redundant. Uh, so loads of concerns <coughs> in there, but these reports don't bring any of that out. Um. It's, it's worth um, reminding the committee that Section 22 reports are a separate category of reporting from the normal performance audit reports that come to the committee, which are um, generally more detailed and more focused on the um, underlying causes and the bigger picture. Um, I think within the uh, report on New College Lanarkshire, which is the one you focused on, um, we have given our view of the causes of some of the problems which have um, been identified. Um, and really, just to summarise, in relation to New College Lanarkshire, we think it was poor financial planning. Um, we can answer some more detailed questions for you very happily if that would be useful. Uh, but in broad terms, um, I reported in the Scotland's College's 2017 report last year about the cash flow problems that the college had experienced and reported that at that point uh, the college was um, working with the SFC to resolve the cash flow issues and plan ahead. As it did that, some of the underlying causes became more visible and that's what we're focusing on here. In broad terms, for 16-17, the college set a very tight budget um, because of the cash flow problems it had experienced previously. And in our view, as we say in the report, its target for income was um, too high and the actual income that it received was almost a million pounds less than the target included in its budget. And on the expenditure side, um, it failed to account for the... Um, full cost of implement implementing national bargaining. Now, it's fair to say that at the point it prepared its budget, New College Lanarkshire, like all colleges, wouldn't have known the exact cost, but it didn't include a provision at all, um, and the actual cost that it faced was 400,000 in the year. So the report gives you some indications of that. We can talk, um, in, we can certainly answer questions about the um, costs relating to things like Cope Bridge and other financial pressures that they faced in 1516. But I think the key point for 1617 was that their budget was too optimistic. Um, and as the college has explored that, um, it's become clear that this college faces longer term questions about its financial sustainability on which it's working with the Scottish Funding Council. But the kind of questions I have are, you know, um, and I take the point, you know, about poor financial planning. But that obviously relates to the key, the key expenditure in any college is obviously staffing. Now, it's my understanding, for example, that there are nine assistant head, heads of faculty in New College Lanarkshire, each earning about £52,000 a year. And of course, if they're earning £52,000, the total cost of employment will be nearer £80,000. Um, and yet, to the best of my knowledge, and you know, I don't know, but are we getting value for money with nine assistant heads when we're making people at the front line, as it were, in the classroom redundant? Similarly, I get similar issues around Edinburgh College, a allegedly excessive senior management team salaries, job titles. Um, we don't know how much of a pay rise, and this was a big issue before with Coat Bridge College, how much of a pay rise the senior management team are getting in relation to the rest of the staff. So surely we should be looking what, behind all of this and questioning uh, the use of resources, because that's fundamental to the remit of a Section 22 report. 
I think um, that's fundamental to the work that the Funding Council should be doing with the college to make sure that it's financially sustainable in future and is delivering value for money. Um, as we say in the report, in return for future funding, uh, the Funding Council is requiring the college to put in place what they're calling a business scenario plan, uh, which looks at, I think, five possible scenarios for the college's operations in future in terms of both the um, curriculum that it offers, the way it supports students, but also the costs and its management structure and so on, uh, the campuses from which it operates. Um, and I think they're questions that are properly focused on the college itself and the funding council. So we should follow up with the college and the funding council on these issues? That's my view. What I've done is to bring to the attention of this committee yes. the challenges to financial sustainability and the fact that um, the scenario plan is not yet agreed between right. the college and the funding council, but I think they're entirely appropriate questions okay. for the committee to explore. Because there are many other issues related. I've just given a, a sample. So convener, obviously, will be for the, the later private session, but I think we should follow the Auditor General's recommendation to follow up with the funding council and the colleges. I think there are certainly issues in the new Lanarkshire college yes. uh, report that, that do require uh, follow-up, so yes. we'll take that on board. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Just taking the uh, Edinburgh College uh, report first, is it realistic to expect that uh, they can repay their deficit through adjustments to future grant funding? I mean, they're struggling to make ends meet, never mind pay what's, uh, what's outstanding. I'll ask Helen to come in in a moment as the auditor of the college, um, but I think my view is that they have made good progress so far in a difficult situation. Um, they are now better at longer-term financial planning, which is an important um, requirement for any public body, um, and that they are building in that re repayment into their thinking about their costs and income for the future. But I think Helen can give you a bit more detail on that. Yes. Thank you. Just to confirm that is the case. In fact, the College have built in over the following three years that funding will come down and, they'll re and they will be able to, to cope with the, the, the loss in, in, the f in the funding. OK. So you're satisfied at the moment that Edinburgh College is uh, performing according to the plan to deliver a balanced situation? Yes, I mean, we, we say, first of all, that they've made good progress. Um, they have, uh, this year, they're due to close off the individual projects within their initial transformation plan. And they've agreed a new strategy for the three years starting this August. Um, so, um, as Helen said, that contains strong financial planning for the future. But we also say in the report they do continue to face significant challenges, like all colleges, um, in terms of implementing the full costs of national pay bargaining and making sure that they can continue to develop the curriculum to meet the needs of learners and employers in the area um, and to do that in a way that continues to be financially viable. But so far they've made good progress with all of that. Turning to North Lanarkshire, which is obviously certainly from my point of view, a lot more concern. Uh, I share the concerns of Alec Neil here, and he did raise a couple of things here which uh, I don't think, uh, or I didn't pick up a, a response on. First one was the unexpected costs at Cope Ridge College. What were they? Um, I will ask um, Mark and Lucy to pick that up. Mark, do you want to kick off? Yeah, so the, the, the college has indicated that one of the most significant uh, unexpected financial implications that it had from Cope Bridge was the college returning a very uh, a million pound deficit when the Cope Bridge College returned a million pound deficit prior to merger when the budget had been a small surplus of about 20k 20,000 pounds um, the this committee's predecessor uh, I think heard some of that and the evidence it took around the Cope Bridge College section 22 when that issue was raised also by committee members the other issues that came up were a couple of costs associated with leases and buildings that hadn't been built into the original uh, uh, merger case, and that was about 250,000, roughly. And so then... The poor reporting by Coatbridge College, was it uh, an error? I, I think I think no one had picked up that these costs could occur, and I, I can't say for certain whether it was down to Coatbridge um, or whether that should have been picked up as part of the, the, the diligence prior and to How much was that? 200, about 250,000 in total. It's not a small sum. Um, yes, it's not. As we say in the report, or this, this report this year, the um, colleges do tend to operate in very narrow margins. And as we say again in the report, 
New College Lanarkshire had set itself a very tight financial budget for 2015-16, although it was aware of these issues when it set the budget and believed it could accommodate them. Uh, the other issue, just to cover off, was the was a, a clawback of ERDF funding, uh, European funding, amounting to about 206,000, I think the figure was. But uh, this question of the leases, I mean, it's p fairly fundamental. Wouldn't, wouldn't internal auditor pick this up? Um, I can't comment. I don't have the background on how the how the issues precisely came to light. Um, it was clearly discovered. I think we make reference to some legacy issues in our 2016 colleges overview report um, from a couple of years ago, where we, where we note that the uh, that the new college Lanarkshire, having identified one legacy issue, decided to investigate a number of other issues to determine whether there was anything else there that they should be concerned about. Would it be possible to find out exactly how this came about? There must be some record of it. Internal audit must have picked it up at some point. At what point? What, what triggered? sudden knowledge that this, these leases were, out, were, were omitted from the calculations? I think the broader background um, is, as I think, Mr Beatty, you were aware as a member of the committee throughout this period that there were significant um, problems around the inclusion of uh, Copebridge College in the merger into New College Lanarkshire. Um, the uh, previous principal and members of the board um, were, uh, first of all, um, very against the idea of merging, uh, then agreed to the merger, pulled out again, and then finally the merger went ahead. The due diligence was um, troubled as a result of that, I think, um, and we we reported on that, and the committee explored that at the time that you were looking at the issues related to the 1415, I think, um, audits of Copebridge College. The point in relation to New College Lanarkshire, though, is that by the time of the 2015-16 budget, those costs were known about, um, and the college felt that it had included them into the budget, but the budget was tight at that point. I reported last year in my um, overview report on the cash flow problems that came about as, as a result. We've now moved on from that, and in 16-17, they again set a budget which was over-optimistic in terms this time of the income target they were expecting to, to receive and the um, cost to staff of national pay bargaining. So I'm, I'm aware of the problems that were around Coatbridge College prior to its merger, um, but still, I'd like to know exactly how the question of the leases were identified, at what point, because I think that's important. Because you would have expected that such a significant omission and such a basic issue would have been found by internal audit. I know did commission its internal audit service to examine this to determine whether there were other legacy issues. I think one of the issues that cropped up was in relation to a, a contract that, that they, they believed could end up in additional costs, but then proved not to be the case. But the New College Lanarkshire, had an interest of ensuring everything had been double-checked, uh, asked its internal audit team to, to review again um, a number of issues, and, and that's where the lease issues came up. So it came up as a result of an internal audit that was commissioned by by, by New College Lanarkshire. Lanarkshire. New College Lanarkshire. New College Lanarkshire. Yeah. But that still doesn't explain why it wasn't picked up before. Well, I think that at this stage. Okay, just mo moving on to some other the other issue which uh, Alec Neil brought up, which is the question of delayed payments to creditors, and uh, you know trying to accelerate payments from debtors. I mean, it's fairly classic that, isn't it? I mean, you'd. You would expect that to be picked up in five minutes. Um, I reported did it. internal mm. audit f pick this up? Uh, well, I reported it in my uh, report on Scotland's colleges last year, um, and the auditor reported it in her annual report on the annual report and accounts last year. At that point, the college thought that it was on top of the short-term, uh, what it then taught, thought were short-term financial issues it faced. Um, that proved not to be the case, and the report you've got in front of you today um, highlights the scale of the challenges they're facing and the financial support they've required from the Funding Council. Can we say that this fairly dodgy practice is now stopped? I think so. Lucy, is there anything you want to add on that? There's no indication that the payment days have increased significantly from 16-17 audit. The, it seems to me that uh, don't colleges normally budget to break even rather than have surpluses? And I see in paragraph 18 there, they're talking about possible surplus. I mean, if you're going to have a surplus of a million pounds, that's not normal for a college, is it? 
It isn't now. Um, before colleges became part of the public sector for accounting purposes, they were able to carry reserves, and some of them did budget to make a surplus so that they could carry that forward for known purposes, for investment, for future cost pressures that they were facing. Um, now, as the committee knows, um, they are within the public sector accounting boundary, and they can't carry forward surpluses um, unless they're able to transfer them into their arm's length foundation um, on the basis that they will be able to request them back later. Mission in paragraph 18 incorrect because 2019-20 surplus of 1.1 million, 2020-21 and so on. I mean, that's not going to happen, is it? Uh, well, they're forecasting surpluses within the um, business scenario planning that they're doing with the funding council to bring them back into financial balance. Part of the um, reason for forecasting that, I assume, may be so that they can negotiate with the funding council what funding they require and also budget to repay additional funding that they receive in the, main t in the meantime. You've heard from Helen that um, Edinburgh College is confident it will be able to repay funding to the funding council. In order to do that, it will have to make an operating surplus so there's funding available to do it. Um, I think the same is true of New College Lanarkshire. I think Mark would like to add to that. Well, the thing I would like to add is that we're talking here about the underlying financial deficit or surplus position. You'll be aware from uh, last year's college's report that we've encouraged a number of adjustments to be made to account so people have a more, uh, more clarity around the current financial position of the college rather than the position as affected by longer term commitments such as pensions and asset revaluations that can affect the figures but which aren't within the college's control. Just, just coming back again. Something came to my mind about this question of delaying payments to creditors and so on. Who approved that as a, as a, as a policy? Anybody would need to approve it. I think the council could do it as its own, at its own hand, um, and it's, I think it was done within the finance department. But Lucy, I guess, can give you more detail. So the finance that. department thought it was a good idea? I think the finance department were probably focused very heavily on trying to um, manage the cash flow position. Um, now, that's clearly not a sustainable way of running the college for the longer term, but I... I I think that was their primary focus. Um, I reported it in my college last my college's report last year because it's mm. clearly not good practice. But, but this and surely is against all accounting principles. I mean, the person running the finance department should be aware of that. Did did they, while doing this, raise it to the board so the board were aware that uh, this was happening? It, it's clearly uh, poor financial management and poor financial planning. I don't know if we're able to say at this point what happened respecting that that was back in 2015-16 and was reported in my report last year. Because it brings Lucy, a governance issue in as well. Lucy, do you know if it was reported to the board within the financial reporting in 15-16? I don't know for 15-16. I do know in 16-17 uh, an internal audit review was commissioned on budgetary control which did highlight a number of significant findings across the finance function that were then subsequently actioned by the college. Um, and as I said, in 1617, there was no indication that there had been kind of um, extension of debtor days and creditor days to manage cash flow. Did that report highlight any other irregularities that perhaps should be raised to the board? And was it raised to the board? The, yes, the internal audit report w was delivered to the audit committee of the Lanarkshire board. Um, and all recommendations in that report have been followed up. Mm. OK. Ian Gray. Um, thanks. I, 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 I wanted to go back, Auditor General, to the business scenario plan that Alec Neil uh, asked a bit about, and um, that's obviously critical to developing uh, some strategy for dealing with the concerns about the longer-term financial viability of the college. And in paragraphs 16 and 17, it says it includes things like um, discussing the possibility of changing structures and a voluntary severance scheme. Uh, and I think um, Alec Neil w was expressing some concern about where that kind of approach can leave you, a voluntary severance scheme that allows uh, simply those who volunteer to, to take severance can leave you with a very top-heavy structure with senior management still in place, but without the, the lecturers to actually deliver the courses in the college. So um, that potentially could be quite worrying. I, I take the point that you made that that's something that we should pursue with the SFC and the management of the college. But that does rather mean that if they come up with a plan which doesn't work, then we will only know that when it hasn't worked. And by that time, the college may be uh, in very severe problems. And it does say uh, in the report that 
you will work with SFC, sorry, you've asked the auditor to keep the position with regard to the plan under review. So I, 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 I just wanted really to ask again, if you are watching the development of this plan in order to ensure that it is something which has the potential to, to work. We certainly are. Um, I would say um, that it, it is nonetheless a matter of fact that the plan is a matter for agreement between the Funding Council and the College. Um, however much it might be tempting on occasions, auditors don't have stop powers. We can't stop people doing things um, in advance if we think they are ill-advised. Um, uh, it's worth noting also that the process of agreeing the plan between the Funding Council and the College has been quite um, long drawn out. It's been an iterative process. I think there have been five drafts submitted by the College to the Funding Council, which have been the subject of discussion between them, and I think we still don't have a final agreed version, and I think that reflects the extent to which the Funding Council is seeking to make sure that whatever is put in place is both financially sustainable but also meets the needs of um, students and employers in the area and that it is focused on the quality of education and training that's being delivered. Um, so we will continue to look closely at it and to report back in future as we have done at Edinburgh College. Um, but, but it's a complex matter that is likely to require changes to the way that the college delivers education and to its estate. I think it currently operates from six campuses. Is that something you might report in, in your, college, your annual College of Scotland report as, as well? Is that a place where you might report on that progress? We might well, but I doubt there'll be much more to say on okay. this college in that report when it's published um, later this month. It's quite soon, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, the, uh, w one of the uh, particular um, failings, mistakes, if that's the right word, that you've mentioned on a couple of occasions uh, and it appears in the report, was the failure of the college to budget at all for the financial implications of uh, national bargaining. Um, and that, in the end, you say the college cost the college £400,000, which hadn't been uh, budgeted for, for at all. But it isn't the case that most, if not all, colleges at that point were saying that they didn't have resources to budget for what they thought would be the potential implications. So that, that, that wasn't an unusual position for a college to be in, was it? I think I said in response to an earlier question, it's certainly true that at the point they were setting their 16-17 budget, they wouldn't have known the exact costs. Um, but I think it was poor financial planning not to include an estimate, recognising that the, the, the true costs were likely to be higher or lower than that estimate. The other aspect of this is that when um, that national bargaining procedure reached a conclusion. Um, nationally, some additional central funds were made available for um, disbursement to colleges in order to meet those costs. Did, did, did the college not receive money from government to cover some of that? I think we're talking about a timing issue, but I'll ask Mark to talk you through it. No, that's right. It is a signing issue. I don't think the money was available at that point in time, at the time they set in the budget or by the, at the end of the financial year. Since then, obviously, the Scottish Government has made a commitment to fund in 16, 17 and, sorry, 17, 18 and 18, 19. And some money was released last year, I know, for that. But that would have been after the time of the, the issues to which we are referring. OK, thanks. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I have a, a number of questions which are not dissimilar to those that Ian Gray's putting on the Edinburgh College report. Uh, so first of all, uh, th this committee looked at Edinburgh College in quite some depth previously, uh, and so I was actually quite pleased to read the Edinburgh College report. It's, it's an optimistic uh, assessment. Uh, but there were some considerable issues the last time we looked at this, so I was perhaps a little surprised. So first of all, how confident are you in the measures being taken uh, and in the progress that's been made, that there will be positive outcomes from this. Um, I'll ask Helen to come in in a moment, um, but as the report says, we think they have made good progress with the plan, and we can see that um, in, uh, for example, the fact that they um, met and indeed exceeded their, their learning target for the first time in 1617, um, that they managed to make the planned savings that were expected, and that they're making good progress with the underlying changes to the way they deliver um, education and training um, in the area. Um, I don't 
um, want to downplay the scale of the challenges that they still face, and we note those in the report. Um, and we also note that the principal who's overseen this transformation program is retiring at the end of August, and a new chair, Professor Sir Ian Diamond, has just taken up post as well. So it, it will be important to keep up that focus on delivering, but equally we have seen real progress. Helen, you're close to the college. Do you want to say a bit more about the, the confidence that you can take from that? Yes, I can, I can possibly add to that in terms of the uh, budget outturn for the end of March, the deficit continues to come down and becomes much more in line with that planned. And in fact, they are confident of exceeding the planned level as well. Um, in terms of activity targets, for in, during this year, they are above their target and they are hopeful of getting more income from the SFC going forward as well. In terms of they've changed, they've put through a lot of changes in terms of courses and, and the way they kind of work to, to sort of bring the sort of staff on board as well and students too. So overall, they've made a lot of progress and they are they are starting to move forward effectively. It's always difficult to say whether the end result will be totally positive, but they are certainly working hard to to get there. And as external auditors, we'll continue to, to sort of watch over it and, and, and see their, their, their progress accordingly. I'll explore a number of those issues, if I may. But, uh, just very briefly on the voluntary severance schemes, uh, uh, the savings that were projected, it hasn't quite delivered what, what was projected. Now, that was something that I specifically brought up at the last uh, session when we looked at Edinburgh College, that voluntary severance schemes often don't go as planned. But why has this one not gone as planned? Uh, wh why was there too much optimism built into the programme, do you know? I, I suppose I can only um, add a comment there to say that they, they obviously planned it in such a way they started off with the admin staff, for starters, until they had looked at the courses and what courses they intended to, to put into place. And then they've moved on to the sort of the, the, the uh, other staff. That obviously brings challenges because they don't want to lose staff across the organisation. They want to be more focused on where the staff can, can 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 move from. And I think that's what's caused the problem. So they were optimistic yet in terms of trying to achieve a number and where those staff would, would leave from. But it hasn't quite worked out that way, although the college have advised that the fourth scheme, they've had quite a lot of interest and they hope they'll, they'll be able to achieve targets. But on that, uh, I take the point that Alec Neal made earlier on about where the staff are coming from. And uh, the college to date has lost or has moved on through the schemes 112 full time equivalent staff. Uh, it's made savings by deleting posts. Uh, but where I'm struggling to square this is that they've also, in that context, increased the learning activity and uh, are projecting to do exactly the same again going forward. Now, so they're delivering more teaching, more credits, but with significantly fewer staff. Uh, is that, first of all, sustainable? Uh, and secondly, what impact does that have on the staff who remain in terms of their ability to teach uh, and the pressures that are on them? It's fair to say right at the very beginning, last year they took a big hit in their targets as well. So their targets were brought down quite a lot. So therefore, the the staff were able to accommodate, if you like, the sort of new targets and the courses as such. Because of the way they structured their VS schemes, they've managed to you like, move staff about and not not lose the staff in the areas that they want to keep, in essence. Um, but the big hit that they took last year has um, helped, obviously, as well. On the courses, so shifting the focus away from the staff to the students now, one of the things that we looked at in the colleges, the, the overall colleges report, was shifting funding, shifting focus can have a, a gender impact uh, on who is studying at these colleges uh, and an impact on the age profiles and whether they're part-time or full-time courses. Can you tell me very clearly, has that happened as a result of these changes within Edinburgh College? I couldn't 
probably tell you definitely, but I'm not aware of anything from the from the accounts from last year. They've disclosed the gender and the, the sort of student interest. I'm not aware of any great shifts. That we would expect them to be monitoring as the business transformation plan um, is uh, taken forward. Um, and again, it may be something the committee wants to explore with the college if it decides to take the report further. Thank you. Uh, final couple of things I'd just briefly like to explore. You, uh, Auditor General, you talked about the principal who's in the report, it says, led the college through this transformation to a point where we're getting quite an optimistic report. That principal's now leaving. Uh, you talked about Sir, Professor Sir Ian Diamond coming in as chair, uh, which is good, which is impressive, but what's going to happen with the principal position? I understand they very recently made an appointment um, just in the last couple of weeks, um, and therefore there will be continuity in terms of somebody being in, in place. And as we say in the report, it will be very focused, very important for the new team, the new chair and principal, to keep that focus on the plan. Uh, and my final question on this, I, the, Ian Gray raised the national pay and the uh, pensions contributions. What, uh, what is the practical impact on the report uh, and the conclusions of the report of those figures? Um, we think that uh, Edinburgh College has um, done a better job of forecasting and planning for the costs of national pay bargaining um, on its own uh, staff and circumstances. Um, those costs are included not just in the current, the current year's forecast, but in the next couple of years' forecasts as well. Um, and assuming that nothing unexpected comes out of that, uh, we think they've done what they can to manage them while recognising they are still a challenge for this college, as for all, ch all colleges. I'm grateful. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Convener, morning. Um, firstly, on the Edinburgh College report, um, in the conclusion section, um, in number 20, you, you say the college has made good progress, and you've used that term a few times, I think, in speaking this morning. So I, I'll take that as its sort of English meaning, that it's sort of better than average progress on, on what they're doing. But you then go on to say the management are confident that the planned financial position will be achieved. Now, you know, it might be news if they weren't confident that, that it would be achieved. I mean, are you confident this will be achieved? Uh, yes, we report it in those terms because we think the planning is um, well, well founded and the first two years of the plan have demonstrated they're making good progress. Um, as Helen said, we're watching closely what's happening with the in-year position and it's moving in the right direction. Uh, but until we've audited 17, 18, I think it's very hard to give you more, more assurance than um, I have this morning and is included it's in the It's like report. stated as a, as a fact rather than a, an opinion. Like. It, it's a fact that management is confident and that I think they've made good progress so that's far. That's the bit that's missing, I think, in, just yeah. in the words then. Ah. Okay. In the, the new college one, um, it, it said that the, I find it, the auditor gave an unqualified qualified opinion but has highlighted concerns about the college's financial sustainability. Um, and then you say that, I, talking about the college taking steps to improve the quality of financial performance, monitoring and forecasting, I've asked the auditor to keep the position under review. Now, I, I would expect if you're just doing an audit, you would be looking at that. What, what do you actually mean by I've asked them to keep it under review? Are you expecting some in, inter, interim reporting or... Um, yes, so the, the code of audit practice under which the auditors I point, I point to their work um, require, as you would expect them to do, the straightforward financial statements review, but also um, picks up four aspects of the wider public audit model that all auditors are required to look at. One of those is financial sustainability, and in, in the normal course of events that will be reported in the annual audit report, which then informs my thinking about whether to bring matters to the attention of this committee. Um, in the case of bodies like New College Lanarkshire, where it's clear there are um, significant challenges that need to be managed, um, I ask the auditor to stay in close touch with events as they develop during the year and to bring that to um, my attention if things um, uh, develop in unexpected ways from there. So that would have happened already um, since the last uh, um, report? Well, this is the first Section 22 report on New College Lanarkshire. Um, well, last audit report. Yes. Um, 
the 2016-17 the um, audit report led to this Section 22 report. Um, prior to that, um, as I've said, I, I noted the cash flow difficulties that New College Lanarkshire faced in 1516. Um, so Lucy and her colleagues at Mazars have been monitoring that closely, and that's what's led to the reporting um, in 1617. That so you there's no more up-to-date position as of today to... I don't, I don't think there's any moving forward. I, sorry, I have um, I've kept in contact with the Auditor General and Mark McPherson, kind of on progress being made, and I've kept up to date with the college in terms of where the business plan is and the stages of approval that's going through, and we continue to keep them updated. But as of today, I mean, it's not been approved as yet, but we keep them informed. Well, there's nothing more to report, anyway. No. So, would we expect to hear from you if you had a concern then? coming out of this? It, it w I would normally not report to you until the end of the next financial year unless something catastrophic were happening. Um, that's not the position we're in at the moment because of the continuing engagement between the Funding Council and New College Lanarkshire. Um, but the normal, the normal route for me to report to you is a Section 22 report at the end of the annual audit process each year. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Um, Auditor General, we, we, we've been talking at this committee for a long time now about the role for internal audit and external audit. Um, but I think we should always remember there's a, there's a clearer duty perhaps in senior management to act responsibly at all times with regard to the stewardship of the finances that they're responsible for. And uh, picking up the example that was raised with New College of Lanarkshire that you've mentioned on page six, um, there was a very an overly optimistic assumption about income generation. And I've heard this a few times over the years in the audit committee, whose role is it is, is it to scrutinise that to make sure that that's deliverable uh, and it's not just a mechanism to balance the books? Um, I think as, as the committee has been exploring very recently in relation to Tayside, um, the re responsibility sits in several places. First of all, the Director of Finance has got a clear responsibility to make sure that the plans are soundly based and solid and that they're reported well to the Audit Committee and the Board of the Public Body. And the members of the board have got a responsibility as well to test and challenge those and make sure they're asking the right questions, um, making sure that they are comfortable with the responses that they're receiving. Um, as Lucy has said, in, this, in the case of New College Lanarkshire, the board made the decision to commission an internal audit of uh, financial management because of the concerns that were coming up around cash flow management um, initially, um, and that has highlighted some recommendations which they are putting in place. Um, but, it, but the responsibility sit first with the Director of Finance and then with the board. In this case, we think the board's done its um, work once those problems came to the fore. They were perhaps a little slow to recognise the challenges coming through 2015-16 and particularly to understand the true underlying causes rather than the historic issues which we recognise around um, Cope Ridge. Mm -hmm. did, did you say that, the, that it was a million pounds less than the income target? 900,000, I think, very nearly. What, what was the actual target? I think the target was 6.1 and they received 5.2 million pounds. Right, so they thought they were getting 6 million but they got 5. I mean, that sounds reasonable, but, but it's a bit challenging whether that's deliverable. I wonder whose role, it's mainly the role of the board and senior management rather than the audit function to say that that's a deliverable target. Would you agree? I, I would agree. As you say, it's, a, it's the board's responsibility to be testing the targets they get. Um, we make the point in the report that all colleges are operating on quite tight margins, so a small difference in income and expenditure can make a big difference. Um, that's very much the case in this college, um, and I think what we've seen is optimism in terms of both um, higher income and lower costs than, than were actually um, incurred in practice, um, and the board um, could have been testing that earlier. Once they identified the problem, um, they really started to explore what the underlying causes were. Okay, and, and the paragraph 18 in the same report there about it's forecasting surpluses of nearly a million pounds in the three years to come. Uh, how comfortable are, are we that that's deliverable? Um, I think I can give the committee less assurance in relation to these um, forecasts simply because the um, business scenario plan hasn't yet been agreed between the college and the funding council. They will be going through a similar process of testing out how realistic it is, how far it continues to meet the needs of learners and employers and what the impact on staff are. But so do, do you know if they're based on income generation targets, though? Do we know that at this stage? No. I don't know. I'm not sure if um, either Mark or Lucy can know. We can't add much to the, the fact that it's still being discussed between the Funding Council and the College, I think. Okay. 
my, my only other query in relation to Edinburgh convener was uh, you mentioned in page five of the Edinburgh report that some of the savings that they introduced related to property and IT costs. You may not have the answer, but the IT costs was that student IT investment or was it staff IT or what was the extent of the saving? Was it services that were cancelled and is there any impact on service delivery as a result of that? Do we know any of that detail? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. We could probably find that out at some stage. Thank you for that. I think that's maybe something we can... I, I think there are issues here and we're going to have to explore this further. Um, so I think that's something we could pick up with the Funding Council and perhaps the College it, itself. Um, Auditor General, we've explored a bit already this morning the issue of national pay bargaining at New College, Lanarkshire. It strikes me that, um, tell me if this is a correct character characterisation, but New College, Lanarkshire have struggled perhaps more than other colleges in managing um, the results of national pay bargaining. Why is that? Um, I would say um, my first reaction is that they have probably erred on the side of optimism in terms of um, minimising the costs for national pay bargaining um, in the same way that they erred on, uh, on the side of optimism in the level of their income forecasts. Um, and I think that reflects their desire to um, bring in a balanced budget in 2015-16 and 2016-17. Um, all colleges started in different positions depending on um, what their terms and conditions were previously and therefore how much difference there was on to uh, the new national set of terms and conditions. Um, other colleges have managed to um, make an estimate which has stood them in good stead without being the right number. Um, this college stands out for not having made a, a provision within its budget for 16-17 for those costs. Mark, is there anything you want to add? Just to clarify, it was for 15-16, the period. The only thing I would add is that New College Lanarkshire, I'm sure, would want to emphasise the fact that at the point of the merger of the the, the predecessor colleges uh, acted as part of the merger process to harmonise pay terms and conditions for staff at all of the, co the predecessor colleges that are now part of New College Lanarkshire. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember which of the predecessors, but one of them was already at the top end, if you like, of the, the salary scales within the sector, and that was a, the level to which they harmonised. So in a sense, they'd already done quite a lot of the uplift to their pay at the point of the merger that created the college. Um, and, and but, but obviously that means that things like national insurance increases and costs and pensions increases will have a you know a higher financial cost for the college. Okay, so they'd already done some of the preparatory work, is what you're saying. I think they've done it as part of the merger process, which is good practice. I think when you're merging organisations to look at the harmonisation of your terms and conditions for all the staff. Mm -hmm. I think what the, what they are saying is that they, so having done that, the, the addition there was some still some additional cost from national bargaining as the harmonisation took place across the sector. And so, if the college were to cite uh, national pay bargaining as one of their biggest challenges, what would your response be to that, Auditor General? Because College of Scotland told us in 2016 that it was a challenge for every college, but clearly from what you've just said, some other colleges across Scotland coped better with it. So to what extent can their troubles be just explained away by that, in your view? Um, I think Colleges Scotland are absolutely right that it's a challenge for every college um, and as we've said colleges started in different positions depending on what their local terms and conditions were and how much of it had been dealt with through the merger process where that was relevant locally. Um, in the case of New College Lanarkshire, as Mark said, um, because one of the three colleges that merged into New College Lanarkshire was at the top end of the scale, um, some of that already had been dealt with during the merger which formed New College Lanarkshire um, two or three years ago. Um, but as Mark's also said, because costs were higher as a result of that, that had a knock-on cost in terms of the employer's national insurance contributions and pension contributions that had to be made, um, which were not um, planned for as well as they might have been um, in the budgets that flowed from there. So I think the underlying issue, as we say in the report, is one of financial planning rather than primarily of the pressures which national pay bargaining placed on the college. It's not to say there weren't pressures, there are for all colleges, but what went wrong here was the financial planning for it. So it was how management dealt with that pressure? The planning for it, that's yes. right, being aware of it. Okay. I think Alex Neil and Ian Gray both touched on a sort of top-heavy 
management structure. You're in a good position, Auditor General, because you've done reports on several colleges throughout Scotland to give us a sense of, do you think the management structure at uh, New College Lanarkshire is too top heavy in comparison with the other colleges you have looked at? I don't think I can give you an answer to that. Um, there's a whole range of factors which will affect the, um, the, the size and shape of a management structure that a college has. Um, this particular college is not far on from a merger of three colleges into one. It operates from six campuses. Um, I think that's one of the things that you may want to explore with the college and with the funding council. Okay. And I have a feeling you're going to give me that same answer to this next question. But on the issue, of course, our... Um, our motivation in all this is, is to look at the effects on, on students. Um, in terms of retention of students and attainment of students, am I right in thinking that's not something you'd cover in your Section 22 report, but uh, w what is your take on how this situation w has affected that? We're all concerned about the impact here on um, students and employers in the area. Um, you're right, it's not something that tends to come up in Section 22 reports, but it is something we cover every year in our annual report on co colleges. Mark, I'm not sure if you can give us a bit more detail now or if you would like to hold off until we publish that report you're in a couple of weeks. Two, sorry, just for the public yeah. record. It's two um, weeks. Go. We'll, we'll publish in two weeks, roughly we'll two, two weeks. weeks. Publish 21st, the 21st of June. Colleges overview in yeah. two weeks, which will give us an indication of how Attain attention and yes. retainment has been affected. Did you want to add, Mr. Well, just McCarthy? to say, I, I'm not sure that we'd necessarily draw a direct link between what's happened here and the, the figures in the report, um, but in the report we will, for, for the college sector, give an indication of the, the levels of attainment, retention, student satisfaction and positive destinations as we... Uh, yeah, we will include an indicator for each college of that. So Good. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll look forward um, to seeing that. Do members have any further questions? Can I thank Audit Scotland very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the committee's public session. Thank you.